Hello, I'm Doug Musio. This is City Talk. Rewriting New York City's tale of two cities. Measuring inequality and the revitalization of cities. Combating the overuse and misuse of jails. Keeping the mentally ill out of jail and inappropriate treatment. Ensuring opportunities to the city's most vulnerable residents. These are just some of the activities and initiatives of CUNY's newly established Institute of State and Local Governance. Here to talk about the Institute of State and Local Governance at CUNY are its Executive Director, Michael Jacobson, and Mark Shaw, Senior Advisor to the Chancellor for Fiscal Policy and the Chair of the Institute. Prior to joining CUNY and helping to create the Institute, Michael was the President of the Vera Institute of Justice. He has also served as New York City's Corrections Commissioner, Probationer Commissioner, and Deputy Budget Director. Mark has served as Senior Vice President at CUNY, overseeing the finances of CUNY's 23 colleges and professional schools. Mark was first Deputy Mayor and Deputy Mayor for Operations under Michael Bloomberg. He served as Senior Advisor to Governor Patterson and was the Executive Director and Chief Operating Officer of the Metropolitan Transit Authority. Welcome, Mark. Welcome, Michael. Thanks. Nice resumes, the permanent government, and, you know, <laughs> sitting in front of me. Okay, what is this institute? Why do we need such an institute? And why is it at CUNY? Who starts? Well, Go ahead, I'll, Mark. I'll, 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 I'll start on why it's at CUNY. It's, it's at CUNY because CUNY's a public university. And, you know, one of the roles of a public university, especially an urban public university, um, is just like, you know, in Iowa, where they help um, people on the farm with livestock and feed. Um, in urban America, part of the role of a public university is to help the urban environment and the city um, that we're in. And New York City is one of the largest cities in the country. It is the largest city in the country. Um, and it, it's a government that operates at a very high level and needs a lot of expertise and experience in it. And one of the roles that we think a public university can serve is to help that city government and, and use that as a model to help governments around the country. Okay, but what is the Institute? What, it's more than you and you, what is it? Correct, well there's, there's about 10 of us now, but so the, the goal- And you know. The, the goal, the, right, and so the goal of the Institute is essentially to do three sort of different but related things. One is we'll do what people usually think of as an institute. Uh, doing in a university, we'll do sort of academic and policy research on state and local government issues, both broad and, as you said in your intro, on specific subjects. Sure. Areas. Um, but really, what we want to do is take that kind of work and work with governments on the ground. Right? We're interested in changing governments and working with governments uh, on the ground who want to do some kind of reform to their system, uh, change the way they do budgeting, change the way they use jails, uh, how they measure inequality or progress on equality over time. And one of the things we thought that there'd be a role for at CUNY was an institute that really helped government, uh, not just city government, and we'll always work with city government because we're part of CUNY, but we have national aspirations. We're already doing national work, and part of the theory of this institute are that there are cities and states all over this country that are in various forms of fiscal distress um, that could really use help in a variety of ways. And I think we, we, we both have certain amounts of capacity. We've hired a really great staff um, of uh, different kinds of folks who both know research and both understand government. And so there was a gap, I think, that CUNY could fill, and that's uh, what we're doing. There's no, no extant operation either in the un our university or in the New York City universities. This, this is really pretty sui generis. Now, what, what is the funding for this? Is, the univers is this, this is a university project? It's a, it's a university project, and the, university, the, the central loss of the university um, helped provide some of the initial funding for it. And, you know, we've been underway for six months now, and we've already gotten money from the Rockefeller Foundation and the MacArthur Foundation. And we're 
um, working on certain projects with the city where we're also getting paid by the city to work on some of these projects. Michael, you mentioned even going national. Uh, you know, it's not only state and local in terms of level, but it's national. What do you, where are you looking nationally? Where do you see growth of really rigorous type of research in this 20 cities project? Talk about that. Sure. Well, I mean, a couple of things. You know, governments generally, as I said in the intro, you know, state and local governments are incredibly stretched, right? It's all they can do to sort of manage their big agencies and deliver the essential services they have to deliver. Sort of thinking through how to get from here to here, how to cope with huge fiscal disasters, how to reform big systems, right? That's capacity that mm -hmm. we can help provide governments that are just strapped. It's not right. like they couldn't possibly do it themselves, but most just don't have the capacity. And we understand government and we understand research. So, as I said, we want to work in the city and state, um, but our ambition is to work nationally. Right. Uh, we're already doing that, as, uh, as you mentioned, for MacArthur uh, around the country. They have a big uh, program on reforming jails around the country. Um, and so, you know, we want to be an institute on government, not, not just city government. Right. Uh, but governments generally because they're inextricably intertwined. That's clearly. correct. And we, you know, we're trying to be very intentional. We were we're just starting up, so we're not going to just work all over the place, right. Everywhere about where we work and what makes sense and building out. And we'll talk capacity. about that more specifically. Um, but you know, it is a it is a national institute. Okay, now. So you're not just doing sort of general professional policy research. In a sense, does the Institute at some point almost become a SWAT team where you come in to a dysfunctional, let's say, fiscally stressed and challenged jurisdiction and actually on the ground provide guidance and advice, et cetera? I mean, is that part of it? <clears throat> exactly. And, you know, part, part of the issue of our personal experience in city government um, and state government in New York has been that we both grew up in the budget world of New York City post-fiscal crisis. Sure. And, you know, one of the important lessons that, that we all learned in, in the city's fiscal crisis was to run a government or a city of this size um, one needs to do a lot of planning. And the whole concept <clears throat> of thinking about fiscal planning versus just annual budgeting yep. was an important outcome of the New York City fiscal crisis. And that's an experience that we can give to other local governments around the country that don't have and didn't have that experience. And, but, and, and but state face, governments. But face the very, very same kinds of problems. Okay, uh, talking about the state, and one of the things that struck me in the difference between the city and the state, along, just along the lines you're talking about, Mark, is we have a mayor's management report. Irrespective of whatever issues you might have with it, it's a valuable document both for managers and for the public. There's nothing at all like that at the state level. There's no governor's management report at all. And I've been searching. What is it about the state versus the city? Is it simply the experience, the near-death experience of the fiscal crisis that, that mandated institutional change? What is it? Why is the state so irresponsible? Um, well, the, <clears throat> the, you know, why is the state so irresponsible? <laughs> I'll be a little careful about this. But, you know, the, the, the reality is that the state was incredibly responsible in helping guide New York City through its fiscal crisis. Sure, prices. sure. And one, one of the problems is that the state um, is unlikely to do to itself what it would, is willing to do to a municipality that, that is under it. Um, and states operate under a whole different world of, of reality than cities do. I mean, states exist in the, in the U.S. Constitution, for right. instance. Cities right. don't. Um, so cities... By definition, they're creatures of the state, so they're always subject. Ah, uh, Dylan's rule, we love. They're, they're always ahead. subject to that that state oversight. Um, you know, the states are now figuring out because of their fiscal constraints that they're facing these issues, and and sometimes they're being brought on by the private sector at this point. You know, whether it's the rating agencies right. that are looking at the states and and opining about their their fiscal future. Um, and so over time, states are going to have to deal with these very issues. I mean, you know, as the federal government deals with its own deficits, one of the, one of the biggest outcomes is going to be putting more fiscal constraints on states and local governments. And, and you know, we hope to be able to, to work with states um, 
to help them, you know, figure out how to struggle with those fiscal problems. Okay. You know, and I should Go ahead, say, Michael. I'm sorry, I wanted to follow <clears> it up <throat> a little, because you mentioned the mayor's management report, um, and you're right, the state doesn't have anything like that. The fact is, most cities and states around the country don't have anything right. like that, right? right? It's not a perfect document, but it has an incredible amount of information, both about its agency's operations, about external things. It's really, uh, and I know for this particular government, um, they're really going to rely a lot on the MMR to, look, to guide how they're Absolutely. doing. Absolutely. And so, you know, one of the things we think about when we do the work, you said it will be sort of like a SWAT team that comes in. And, you know, that analogy is true up to a point, but really what we're interested in is when we do an engagement in a <clears throat> city, in a state, around whatever issue it is, we're really interested in building their capacity. Sure. Right? We're not going to be there forever. No. We don't want to keep coming back. Yep. We don't want them to have to keep You teach them how to fish. On, okay. Right. right. Uh, and that's a big part of what we, of what we try to do. It's, it's not easy, but ultimately you can't just keep relying on sort of one-shot parachute engagement. Sure. So we're very intentional. About sure. It. Okay. Let's move. And I was fascinated by the number of and, and the type of projects you're involved in. Let's start, in my mind, the most interesting because I am a social scientist who digs into this modeling and math stuff. Talk about the inequality project, what it actually is, what it's intended to do, and what are the real world consequences of it. Sure. Go ahead, Michael. Well, as you know, one of the things that our that's incredibly important to our mayor, who became mayor largely because he really hammered home the issue of inequality and in tale of two cities. It's an issue that not only he is personally interested in, but the whole government in the city is focused on. He has this group of mayors around the country yep. that are starting to focus it. And so after discussions with both uh, his staff, the city, the Mindy Tarlow with the Office of Operations, yep. and Rockefeller, um, as a funder, Rockefeller was really interested in funding something that both the public and the city could use as a tool to see, in fact, in some ways answering the Ed Koch question. So how am I doing yep. um, around inequality? Where's the city starting from and how is it doing over time? And when we think about looking at that, we think obviously of the usual sort of income and wage issues that right. people talk about. But, you know, inequality trickles down to everyday life. Uh, is transportation accessible for disabled right. people? How is the city treating folks and inmates with mental illnesses, et cetera? So we're developing a sort of indicator tool that's very specific, both on those sort of broad financial issues, mm -hmm. but also kind of everyday life for its most vulnerable residents. Yeah, I mean, you've got, I mean, going through this, I, again, and, you know, getting off on this kind of stuff is maybe a little bit perverse, but <laughs> you really have a model here that once you get the, the requisite data really is predictive and, and at the same time remediative at the same time. I mean, this, if you do this work, you really do have a methodology that could be used anywhere. Right, and you know, part, part of this is the whole issue of bringing evidence-based research, right? Yep. Into, you know, out of the classroom and into um, the government. And, you know, New York is a wonderful place to be doing this. Um, we, we think it can provide a model um, that we can bring to other cities, and it's one of the things we're talking to Rockefeller about is to, is to actually take this very model and bring it to some of their 100 Resilient Cities project. Right. Okay. Again, uh, this is a little bit of self-interest, so this is full disclosure. One of the problems with city data and, and recognized by the uh, Office of Operations is we don't survey our residents in terms of their opinions, perceptions, values, etc. Why don't we do that? We did it once in 2001 and we did it once in 2009 and forgot it. Why don't we ask the people what their experiences are? Mark. Well, you know, sometimes it's a resource. I'm blaming you so, personally. So, sometimes, <laughs> sometimes it's a resource issue. Um, and, you know, one, one, of the, one of the tricks to <clears throat> figuring out how to do some of this social science research in the government um, is actually to, to go through and figure out how to do it in an efficient manner. And, you're, you know, it, it, it costs money to put together some of these programs. Right. Um, but, you know, p part of the issue is, is explaining to the government, whoever the government is at right. the time, um, how it is in their interest to have a better government and for them to function better if they m 
figure out a way to make use of some of this research. Yeah, except for the fact that chief executives don't like surveys that point out that their administration is not picking up the garbage appropriately. So you've got that natural but that, political. That, right, but th that that's why a place like a public university that can be both nonpartisan uh -huh. and, you know, we're not part of the government. We're 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 trying to set up a structure where we can help the government, okay. but we are separate from them, so it gives us the ability to provide that objectivity and hopefully not get screamed at as much. And what you're saying, <laughs> well, and what you're saying, and you'll get screamed at anyway. <laughs> but as much, Go ahead. what you're saying about polls, polling is incredibly important. You know, people think of polling, understandably, because this is what most polling is, as sort of horse race polling: who's winning, who's losing, um, in sort of political races. But as you say, it's incredibly valuable for the government and the public to know over time what the public thinks about whatever it is. And people how know, agencies pick, are performing. Up the garbage, how the jail system sure. is running. And so, you know, in, in our sort of methodology when we do this kind of work is it's incredibly important to look at administrative data and data sets that exist in government and outside of government. But one of those data sets is finding out consistently over time what people's perceptions are. It's mm -hmm. incredibly important and you know the government can argue well you know the people think this but we're doing this but that's a good discussion to have right and you know if you're a leader over time you want to see are people more or less satisfied about picking up the garbage you right. may not be happy right. with what they're saying but how better to know right. that that's an area you right. have to deal on and as mark said i think that the perfect place for polling like that to exist is in a city university, right? Um, both because we have, you personally have the skills to do it, but also we sort of live outside the day-to-day -day operations of the government. And so we have, I think, some legitimacy to say this is, in fact, what people and, are thinking. Any sense that the, this particular administration understands that, or do you build it and they will come? I, 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 I think it's a mixture of both, right? You know, I mean, you know, any new administration that comes along, you always have high hopes for um, them and, and especially an administration um, like this where, you know, I mean, while Bill de Blasio is obviously a newcomer to being mayor of this town, he's not a newcomer to being a political operative. Absolutely. Um, so he grew up in the politics of, you know, the David Dinkins administration. Um, where I a first number met of us right, knew right, him, right. him back then. Um, we worked with Bill Lynch. Um, you know, so it, he, he's not a newcomer to this process. He's just a newcomer to his position. Right. Okay. Other project, another fascinating project is the jail or mental institutions, and that is the dramatic misuse and overuse of jails. And it's just, I mean, you just read the magazines and the newspapers and it's, it's constant. Talk about that project, sort of its generation, where you are and what you expect to come out of it. Right. Well, so there's two projects we're doing, one with a national focus and one uh, New York City. Uh, as you know, the mayor formed a task force to look at the intersection of behavioral health and criminal justice a couple of months ago. Uh, Liz Glazer, who's his director of criminal justice, yep. and William Paoli, who's the deputy mayor for social services, are co-chairing it. And there, and we're, and we're doing a piece of the staff work around data for that. You know, there, the object is, and I should say as I describe this, this is not just a New York City issue. I mean, I'll, I'll be oh. talking about New York City, but this is a national right. issue. And, uh, you know, what's happening is the figure usually used is about 37.5 to 40 percent of everyone in jail uh, has some form of diagnosable behavioral health problem, and a good piece of them have serious mental mm -hmm. problems. Um, so really what any city wants to do is make sure, you know, no good can come of being in jail for most of those folks. Now, some of them are, in fact, public safety threats, right. and they have right. to either to themselves or to others. But a lot of them are committing sort of quality of life crimes because that's what mentally ill folks yep. do and you have to respond to it. And obviously the police commissioner is very attuned to it. But what you want to do after, if they do get arrested, is even before they're arrested, perhaps divert them to some kind of community-based program. But you want to have the resources to both diagnose who's mentally ill, how much of a risk are you to public safety, and if you're mentally ill and you have some manageable condition and you're not a threat to public safety, then let's manage you in the community. Let's get you the treatment you need because going in and jail over and over again is only going to make you worse. And essentially what the public is doing in those cases is spending money and it costs about $170,000 to keep someone in Rikers for a year, is spending money to create a public safety and public health problem and that's not the position you want to be in.
But this community treatment, I mean, I was around when you had the deinstitutionalization mm -hmm. wave in the mid 60s, and it was a variety of factors. And the, the answer always was get them out of the institutions into community treatment. Right. Do these facilities exist? Is there a social infrastructure that could adequately handle? How do we do it? Right. Well, the way you do it, and, and part of the answer to your question is they don't exist in the numbers of the amount that you're going to need them, right? Um, but we know that jails, which happen to be in the United States the largest institutes, uh, the largest institutions for handling mentally ill people in yeah. the country, the Los yep. Angeles jail is the largest institution that deals with mentally ill people in the United States. Um, and it's just not, that's not where you want to be. And Rikers is, you know, it's a lot smaller than Los Angeles, but Rikers is not small either. So you're correct. There was, the problem with the deinstitutionalization that happened in the 60s is the theory was you'd get them out of these big, you know, very sort of high profile, not particularly positive institutions, sure. and you'd create some capacity in the community. Yep. They did get them out. They didn't create the capacity right. in the community. See what happens? Right. They wind up in jail because right. they, they panhandle, they squeegee, they, you know, criminal trust, all the stuff that mentally right. ill folks do that people care about. Right. So part of what you have to do is not only identify who these folks are, the earliest possible point, either an interaction with a police officer in the street or at the arraignment but where a bail decision is made, you want to identify who they are and then you have to have the capacity, some of it may be residential, sure. some of it may be outpatient, but you must have the capacity to deal with them. And the way you'll ultimately do that by keeping people out of jail is that's how you'll fund a lot of this right. capacity. Right. And it'll, be, it'll provide more public safety for the citizens of New York, but it will also be better for the individuals themselves. Okay. I want to I move on because there are some fascinating things. This 20 cities, resilient cities, initiative. Talk about your role in that and what the Institute's doing. What you're doing now and what you hope to do. Well, one of the things that's a, a, a MacArthur Foundation, uh, which has long, MacArthur has a long history in doing juvenile justice yep. work. Um, and when I was heading the Vera Institute before I came here for the last nine years, we were one of the people that helped MacArthur do that. Absolutely. Work. And so, good stuff. Yeah, it was good stuff. And so one of the things that MacArthur has decided is as they wind down their juvenile justice work, they're going to get more involved in the adult okay. system. Um, and they're picking jails. Uh, there, are a lot of, there are a lot of foundations that are working on prisons, sort of the, what we consider the back end of the okay, system. Okay, yeah, make the distinction between <laughs> okay. jails and prisons. So, so prisons essentially are where you go once you've been convicted of a felony. Uh, for, in most places, New York being one, if you do time of one year or more, okay. you're going to prison. If you do time of one year or less, you're going to stay in a local facility. But really, who stays in jails are not people who are sentenced. It's people awaiting trial. Right. And right? this is Rikers. That, that's Rikers. They can't make, about three quarters of everyone at Rikers is can't what make we call bail. a pretrial detainee. Yeah, you can't make bail. They're accused of something. Yep. The judge sets $1,000 bail. You don't have $1,000. They're going to sit there until the pendency of their trial. So one of the reasons... That, 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 that also is no, no, insane. It's, a, it's an issue. And so one of the reasons MacArthur wants to focus so heavily on jails is because, although people talk a lot about prisons, understandably, and sure. I've done a lot of work on this over the course of my life, is Americans' real experience with incarceration is in jail. 11.7 million Americans go in and out of jail each year. That is a lot of people, and it's about nine. And they haven't, none of them have been convicted. That's correct. Um, so, so you really, it's a very punitive, very expensive resource. Like most things, like prison, we tend to overuse it. And so the only reason to be in jail, if you're a pretrial detainee, is if you're a threat of flight or if you're a threat to public safety. Yep. Um, other than that, you shouldn't be in jail. Most people, Mark, you, me, if we do something wrong, we get arrested, and a judge says, come back in three weeks. We're going to come back in three weeks. Yeah, that's, that's it. I mean, maybe not if we were accused of a serial killing, and in which case we'd be in jail. Right. But most people <clears throat> come back. Vera right. approved that years right. ago when it did the first bail agency. And so I think Mac one of MacArthur's goals is really to answer the question, who really belongs in jail? Who should go to jail? Who needs to go to jail? What are alternatives to jail? And right. So, it's complicated because unlike prisons, where there are 50 prison systems, right. there are 3,000 jail systems, <clears throat> wow. ranging from two beds to 22,000 beds. And they get very little oversight. Yep. The public really isn't very aware yep. of what's going yep. on. And so 
you know, MacArthur, I think, to its credit, is at the very beginning stages of this, thinking through how do you do this, what makes the most sense. Excellent. But it's, it's all about trying to create a national conversation around jails, do some work in some uh, specific places, and build capacity. But that, that will all be formally announced, not probably for a few months. Okay. What's coming up? Well, what do you, what do you got on the back burner or on... On, on the count of mixing it up. <laughs> well, one of, so one of the things we're very interested in doing, uh, we've, as Mark said, we've, we've gotten MacArthur funding and city funding and Rockefeller funding. We want to start getting national uh, sort of competitive grant funding, whether it's NIH or the National Institute of Justice. Okay. Because uh, it's very important for us to do that kind of research and to take that research and connect it okay. to work okay. on the ground. We're going to start doing more on the pure sort of fiscal side, as, as Mark said, helping helping local governments think about essentially how to get from here to there in the midst of a fiscal crisis and getting through a fiscal crisis, mm -hmm. right? This is, it's very difficult stuff. I think we both have pretty relevant experience. To, I would certainly say so. To doing that, and so we're gonna start doing more of that nationally, but as I said, we're, we're trying to be very intentional about how we do this and sort of build slowly and not sort of outstrip our capacity, but sure. we're, we're very excited sure. about it. In three years, what do you hope and expect and or expect out of this institute? Um, what I, what, what I, my goal would be, and I'm going to say five years, not three. Okay, I think, fine. I think it needs that kind of time frame, um, is for people to look back and realize that we made a difference in the operating and running of this city and other cities and states around the country and start to build a national reputation that Allow, allowing one to bring social science research into and, and be part of government decision making Good. Um, is something that will make government a better operating place. As one of those people who do this kind of thing, we welcome this. <laughs> my thanks. My special thanks to Mark Shore and Michael Jacobson for being on the show and kudos for taking on the issues faced by us as citizens of New York City, New York State, and the United States. Join me next week when my guest will be indie filmmaker and documentarian Heather Quinlan here on CUNY TV. Hello, I'm Doug Musio. Let us know what you think about this show. You can reach us at cuny.tv. When you get there, click on the bar that says contact us and send your email. Whatever it is, thanks, no thanks, obnoxious, do it. Send it. <laughs>